if you knew you were enough? What would your life look like? What would love look like? This is the Enough Factor Broadcast, where we're redefining what makes you enough in life and in love. Now here's your host, Suzette Birna. Hello, everybody. I'm your Life and Relationship Solutions Coach, Suzette Virnon, and welcome to Enough Factor Podcast. Thanks for those who continue to pick up what I'm putting down and for the new folks listening. Whether you were told about the podcast or rolled up on us quite by accident, I am so grateful to greet you. The mission of this podcast is to help you redefine what makes you enough on your own terms by amplifying your voice, your value, and your vision, three critical factors of enoughness. And it will help you to get the clarity you need so you can experience love and life in a brand new way. We're all for that, right? So here to help me with that very thing is my sister in purpose, capacity coach, Nicole Rohn. Nicole helps women just like you create balance between your personal and professional lives while prioritizing self-care. A wife and mother of two, she has steadily and successfully climbed the corporate ladder by supporting billion-dollar organizations for over a decade. Because of her corporate experience, Nicole understands the unique challenges of busy, high-performing women, and how a lack of fluidity between the worlds of home and work can create a barrier between them and their next level. For this reason, the art of flow is a force that she teaches to female power players, helping them to find a rhythm between their personal and professional life in order to propel them into greater levels of desired and sustainable success. So join me in giving a hearty Enough Factor podcast. Welcome to Nicole Roan. Welcome, Nicole. Hey, Suzette. I'm so grateful to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad you're here, too. Oh, my (laughs) goodness. Just, Just having a conversation with you. Someone I had had my eye on and who never disappointed. (laughs) I was like, yes, she has to be on my podcast. I love your flow, girl. I love your flow. (laughs) Thank you. And just, you know, even the name of your podcast, that's why I do what I do, because we are enough in all of the things that we do, having that enough factor. So I'm honored to be able to be here to talk through it. Fantastic. So with season three. I began my podcast with what I call a truth and dare question. The good news is it's not the traditional truth or dare. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But the bad news is you don't get to choose. (laughs) Okay. Okay. You got me. (laughs) I got you. So if you're ready, I want you to answer this question. Okay. I'm ready. Is the truth that you're trying to juggle everything taught you and dared you to take radical action. Well, the truth of trying to really be a mom, be a wife, be in a leadership role and take care of myself. The truth is that it was very, and still is hard. Um, But the what, how it dared me to take action was to start managing my capacity. And when I think about capacity, I think how much something can hold, right? So if we think of ourselves and all the different things that we are juggling on a day-to-day, these competing priorities, we only have so much capacity to do it all. And so Back in 2019, my body literally was at max capacity and had been operating like that for so very long to the point where I ended up in ICU for over a week 
fighting for my life because the amount of stress that I was under between trying to juggle these multiple priorities literally was shutting my organs down. And Mm. so, yeah, at that time, I had to dare to do something different. And so I decided, of course, after praying to God and asking for healing and doing all of those things, I decided to start being an advocate for other women who are suffering in silence with this, who are struggling. So I dared to um, step back from my full-time six-figure cushy HR job and walk fully in purpose and coaching other women who are struggling with capacity and really creating balance between their personal and professional lives. Mm, That is wonderful. So why do you think that we do that? Why do you think, I, I know there was a song and I'm going to reveal my age, but there was a song that I can bring home the bacon, yes. fry it up in the pan, and <laughs> never, never, never let you forget you're the back. Sing it with me, because you're a woman, Anjali. Whoever wrote that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. needs to be fired. <laughs> Because that's the thing. It's like we've grown up on this belief, this superwoman belief that if we can do all those things, it makes us somebody. It makes us successful. It makes us somebody to to take seriously. Right. Mm -hmm. So but in reality, just like you said, we might be riding high for a while, but our bodies and our relationships Yes. Will eventually tell the tale. So why do you think that we want to believe something that's slowly killing us and and zapping our capacity, right? Mm -hmm. But what really matters, right? Yeah, I think it's a couple of different things. Number one, because just like the song you just sang that I was over here dancing to, (laughs) um, We have been taught traditionally by our mothers, our grandmothers, our great grandmothers, our aunties, well-meaning friends that you are supposed to be able to do it all because we've seen them do it all, carry it all and not ask for help. And so we're mimicking their behaviors. But on top of that. I actually wrote an article in um, a Black Excellence magazine called Swanye Swank. Yes, I saw it. (laughs) It was so good. Oh, yeah. About capacity and this, especially for Black women, right? This syndrome of being strong because we've been depicted to not be breakable, to be able to do it all. And that's what makes us glorious and black girl magic and all of those things. But that's a whole lie. Like not only does our health suffer, but as you mentioned, our relationships suffer because we can't be there for anybody else if we can't be there for ourselves. We're given from empty cups and feeling resentful and angry. And honestly, there's a song by Beyonce called Who's Gonna Save the Hero. I did a whole podcast episode on it because it it talks about how while we're doing all of these things for everybody, giving ourselves to work, giving ourselves to, you know, friends and sometimes family members at night, we're at home crying by ourselves because we're so tired and we're so stressed out. Um, So I think, again, it's a multitude of reasons, but mainly those two, because we saw other people do it and we don't know how to ask for help. Um, We have society telling us who we are or who we should be. And then honestly, even when we ask for help, we don't know how to accept it. (laughs) We still want to do it ourselves. (laughs) That right there is big. And I've been pondering, why is it that we're the ones, the quickest ones to be right there? You know, if you need me, I'm here. We're there. We're the movers and shakers. We're the ones our families rely on. We're Mm -hmm. the ones that get called when, when somebody needs something. We're reliable. We're dependable. So I'm, I'm really curious about this whole thing of, Offering it to other people, but not being able to receive it ourselves. Do you have any thoughts as to what makes us not receptive, even when we so willingly, generously Mm -hmm. give it out to other people? Well, I think it's and I'm speaking from personal experience. Sure, sure. I used to tie my worth to what I could do for other people. And. 
while naturally I am a nice person, I'm giving, I recognized early that when you're nice to people, people like that, right? And so I started to equate my worth, my value with what I could do for other people. And it sprinkled from at home to being at work. I'll take on the extra project. I'll do the training. I'll stay late. I'll do those things. And then even at home, right? I'll do the laundry. I'll do the dishes. I'll cook the food and I'll wash the kids. (laughs) And it's not until you, sometimes I hope people don't have to be forced to sit down, but when you sit down, like we kind of talked about with COVID, that you realize people get addicted to being busy. Yeah. Yeah. So, Yeah. So it's hard sometimes to take our own advice and apply that to our lives because it's just the way that we have normalized things. It's become a normal part of our culture. Yeah, because it's admittedly it's a high. Mm. It's like we don't take drugs. We don't drink alcohol. But our drug of choice. Is working ourselves to exhaustion. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I'll admit it. I'm a recovering workaholic. <laughs> Same I, here. I'm in recovery. <laughs> Sometimes I get it right. I relapse often, but I have to show grace to myself because I'm at least trying to kind of hold myself more accountable mm-hmm. because it, it really, workaholism, I really believe is the new epidemic addiction. Yes, I really do. I think we've glorified it and we romanticized it. Mm -hmm. But if we were to really tell the truth, many of us don't know how to occupy. And that's something we talked about how, yes, yes, you build. Sure. And we get drunk and, and caught up in the building and forget that the reason we're building it is to occupy that space in some meaningful, serving something bigger than ourselves way. Yes. Right? Yes. So with, in your work with your coaching clients, how do you help them to become more mindful of, of, of their capacity and to come up with some, gen, some insights and some mind shifts that they have to make in order to have a more fulfilling and really more sustainable way of living. Yeah. One of the main ways that I work with my clients, it's a requirement that you take the capacity calculator before we work together. And the capacity calculator is a tool I created that really helps us to become aware of what's on our plate because you can't change or you can't face what you don't know or what you won't fix. And so we start by assessing, you know, what am I spending my time on? Who am I giving my time to? And is that really tied to what I truly value? Is it tied to my goals and my priorities? And what I find is that oftentimes we are spending so much time, energy, and even money on things that have nothing to do with what we value. Taking on other people's problems, paying other people's bills, giving out our energy and our most prized possession, our time. We're giving that away. Yeah. And so I start by, you know, once we take that assessment, Clearing everything off the plate. Let's take it off the plate, right? Mm -hmm. And let's figure out piece by piece what really needs to be on. So we work through what is it that you really value? Because for instance, if you say that you value your family, yet you spend 80 hours a week working, where's the time for your family? Or, you know, if you say that you care about your health, you know, whether it's mental, emotional, physical, because they're all related. How mm-hmm. much time are you spending getting therapy, going for a walk, practicing self-care? You can't do that if you're not aware of what's already on your plate. So we just kind of we start there and start the mind shifts on how do we manage this? How do we tie what our, you know, I'm a to-do list person. I still write out my to-do list, even though I have planners and, and you know, electronic digital things. Um we start to see what we're spending our time on needs to be a value add. So for Mm -hmm. me, that looks like um, once I take my son to school, 
I stop and I go to the gym first thing in the morning, even when I don't feel like it, because I value my health. I want to be here for a long time with my family. Mm -hmm. And in other scenarios, I schedule out time with my husband specifically. We have date night. I have Wednesdays where I spend with my son. He stays home. And then um, on Thursdays, it's Grey's Anatomy night with my daughter. So there, listen, (laughs) listen. Yeah. You Grey's Anatomy for show. I love it. You said something at the beginning, and I know that I'm in the right place because what I really help my clients to do is to increase their capacity so they can create a life on their terms where they're not burnt out, yes. where they know how to occupy the spaces they're in and practice self care. Oh, girl, let's talk about on their terms because <laughs> here's the thing I had to reconcile. It was my come to Jesus moment. Mm. I had to reconcile what was keeping me from living my life on my terms. Yes. Isn't that hard work, though? It's not easy. Oh, girl, it's hard work. And I I mean, and it was really telling because people don't think about it. But when we're there for everybody all the time, trying to live up to what they want us to be and do and what they've told us we ought to be and do. Mm-hmm. My, my, what was keeping me from living my life on my terms, to be completely honest with you, was people pleasing. <sighs> and people I'm don't like, people girl, people over yeah, here, I'm though. in recovery, girl. I'm in recovery, but <laughs> so many things. Yes. But it's just like, because we don't, Sometimes we don't look at it as, as people pleasing because we're not running behind them saying, oh, please, 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 please tell me what I can do so I can just leave my life and just live for you. You yep. know, tell me how to serve you. We don't do that. It's, mm. it's more subtle. We call it ministry now. Mm. You know, we call, now. It, we call it serving. We give it these glossy, noble words. But. Is still coming from at a fundamental cellular level, not feeling like we're enough unless we are pleasing you. Yes. Or pleasing some ideology that's indirectly pleasing you. Even the way we try to compete in this world, we're trying to please somebody else's definition. Yep. And something else we said last time, listeners, we're going to let you in on it because it was yummy. A lot of us have bought into the belief that wealth is material gain. Wealth is money. Mm -hmm. And so we chase a lot of these things thinking that they're going to make us somebody, make us relevant, make us matter. Right. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things when we were talking about that before was that, you know, this whole thing about wealth, that wealthy people don't sweat. Exactly. I thought about different people that I have watched and observed either on television, just their very body language. is like I'm in command. I rule this piece right here. I, 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 yeah. I rule. So I don't have to sweat. And that whole thing of of instead of I was I was really communing and thinking about that in anticipation of us talking this morning mm-hmm. and in my quiet time with God. And I was talking about we kind of thinking about that wealthy people don't sweat. I took out my trusty journal because I like you like to write things down. <laughs> yes. And I started looking at areas. Where my busyness was eroding my capacity. And I look at capacity Ooh. and wealth at the, as the same thing. Yeah. So I couldn't wait to talk to you. It's like <laughs> capacity is wealth. It is. It, I'm so it, excited over here. <laughs> girl, my toes are wiggling. I know people can't see it, but my Thanks. toes are wiggling. And that's what makes your work so relevant. It's not because time is wealth. Yeah. Capacity is wealth. Because if these wealthy people did not have capacity to create and to make and to delegate, they would not be wealthy because they would be on the hamster wheel like we are trying to dream and execute, dream and execute. You'll never get wealthy if you are if you are everything. 
Yeah. You can't live wealthy. You don't have time to put time toward the things that you say you value. Yep. Right? Yeah. Woo. You said a couple of things. Um, number one about delegation, right? Because that's another part of what I teach because we said, you know, we don't know how to ask for help, let alone accept it. And we have to be able to delegate, not just in the office or working from home. You have to be able to do that in both your personal and your professional settings, because being busy does not mean the same as being productive. And oftentimes I'm asking my clients, what do you need to make room for? Like, do you have room to be wealthy? Do you have room to take care of yourself the way that you need to? And that's what the clearing of the plate is for, so that we can really get back to the basics and understand what we need so that we can thrive, so that we can get out of, you know, just survival mode and being able to really focus on those things that are going to bring us there. Because like you said, running on that hamster wheel, we can't always be building and flying the plane at the same time. I truly believe there's a season for everything. When you're building, you're building. But when are you going to occupy what you've built? Because at some point you have to step back and be the CEO of that company, be the homeowner of that home. How do you do that if you're so busy running around stressed out like a chicken with your hair cut off? You Mm. can't. So your capacity, you have to make room, literally have to increase your capacity for the things that you say you want, for the things that God has told you he has for you. You have to make room for those. Yeah, because even with um, the whole capacity and looking at all the areas of my life, one of the things that I had to look at in making and building capacity and, and, and in allowing me to sit on the throne that I've been praying to have. Yes. Oh, please talk about that. <laughs> because, you know, especially the, those of us in Christendom, we are so quick to tell people that we're blessed and highly favored. Right. We're so quick to tell people that we are joint heirs with Christ. Well, this is the thing. And I thought about this even uh, when I was thinking about the whole thing about Jesus and and everything. And it's like when people were asking him after he had died and, and rose again, because we're in that season, we're, we're leading up to that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, something stood out for me that I had never s- seen in this way of us occupying, mm-hmm. in this way of us having capacity to rule, to have the very things that we're asking for, the very mm-hmm. things that the divine in us is trying to birth. It was this. He said, you know, basically, deuces, I'm going and I'm sitting down. He has several seats. I've done the work. So I'm ready to sit. I'll intercede for you, but I'm not going to do the work for you. I'll intercede. I'll be on the right hand of my father, but I'm giving you the authority. I'm giving you the authority because I've done the work. I freed up the space. You in right relationship with God again. You know, you're joint heirs with me. You got this. You're kings. You're you're of a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. So I'm giving you what you need to occupy. Mm -hmm. I'm giving you what you need. So no, don't don't ask me. Because I built, I came and I delivered. I came and I, I, I purposefully built what I came here to build. Mm -hmm. So now I'm sitting down because I don't have to work anymore. To me, that's the greatest example of occupying. Yeah. He, he, and he doesn't even allow us to manipulate him into coming back and doing it. (laughs) Ain't that the truth? He doesn't, he doesn't allow us to manipulate him into doing it again. It's like, no, I'm not going to die again. I told you it was finished. I told you it was done. Mm -hmm. Now, am I occupying it? I'm holding myself and you accountable. How many of us don't hold? We don't hold people accountable in the way that, that we should, if we truly, truly, truly 
believe that we are these very things that we confess and profess. And I'm the first one. I'm not saying it as somebody who has attained it, but I hope to be a good student. Mm -hmm. That when the Lord, you know, downloads something, I'm learning, I'm learning to listen for the whisper and not wait for the brick upside my head. We listen because that brick ain't no joke. <laughs> and you you said something. Mm. It's it's the boundaries, right? Like the yeah. boundaries that we're setting for ourselves. Like Jesus said with us. Like I've been here, I've done that. I'm leaving you to do the work. And so oftentimes we may think that we can pray things away. We don't have to do the work. I'm just going to pray. Jesus, no, I need capacity. No, you got to work at it. That's that's not how it works. You know, I'm going to pray that this relationship gets better. How is your relationship with yourself? Because if you're not any good to you, you can definitely be no good to anybody else. And learning how to just really understand how what you spend your time on, who you spend your time with, all the things that take up your energy and fill your capacity, it matters. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have any sort of boundaries for yourself, your time, or the people or places or the things that you do, then you're not going to be able to occupy. You're going to be in build hamster mode the entire time. And when you talk about relationships, Let's go there in relationships, <laughs> capacity and relationships, because here's the thing. And you can tell me if you see this happen with your clients and with people that you're around. And I can talk about it because I was once one. I tell people I coach what I was. Exactly. That's why <laughs> we're here to help coach people what through I what was. they through. <laughs> right. But this thing where people are willing to invest in other areas of their lives. They're willing to invest in every other area of their lives. But when it comes to the relationships, that is the first place where there it's like the boundaries go out the window. Mm -hmm. The work they've done on themselves goes out the window. When Mr. Wonderful shows up, or at least who you think is Mr. Wonderful, I've seen the most disciplined women lose every bit of it for that quote unquote Mr. Wonderful or Mr. Potential that they think can can be to them whatever it is that they need him to be. And one of the things that I've really been dealing with my clients on is integrity. Mm -hmm. Integrity in their relationships. Mm -hmm. Are you truly showing up as who you really are? Not your representative. Not your representative. Not what you were told men want. Mm -hmm. Not what was modeled for you. But have you done the work on yourself in the right way? Mm -hmm. To become a contributor in a relationship? Or in a contaminator mm. in your relationship? Have you built capacity in you for the relationship that you've been praying and begging God for? Because if you'll throw yourself away and betray yourself over the first man that pays attention to you, or as I say, ringy dingy's your emotional G spot, <laughs> then what kind of capacity? then that shows that you really don't have capacity for that relationship. They think that getting the man is what they're after. I mm -hmm. said, but what happens once you get him? How you keep him. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and without, him. without losing yourself in the process. Yes. That the longer you're in the relationship, the more you disappears to the point that if the relationship ends, not only do you lose the man, but you've lost yourself too. Then that mm -hmm. means something's wrong in your capacity. Yeah. And you know what? This sounds like heart flow to me because I have five different pillars. Okay. Um, and heart flow specifically focuses on the relationships and the people who pull on our heartstrings mm. and how we show up is impacted by those people. 
whether it is, you know, Mr. Wonderful or your mom, your dad, your siblings, your friends, because I believe, I think it's Proverbs 423. Don't quote me. I won't. But, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I can't even look on my thing know, to see. Somewhere around there, y'all, y'all know how to Google it. There. Just <laughs> Google it. Just but Google it. But it basically <laughs> says that, you know, whatever flows out of your heart flows out of your mouth. Right. Yes. Out of the issues of your heart. Is yes. That it? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so if you have not done the work in here, like you said, to be able to sit with your silence and be proud of your silence, to understand your worth, understand your value, not only are you going to continue to attract people that are not good for you, right? Mm-hmm. You're also not going to feel good about yourself because you keep repeating the same cycles over and over. So I always say with any decision, I have to check my heart. I have to ask myself, right? Is this right for me? Why is it right for me? And really working on the issues that are in there because they're going to come out one way or another. Mm -hmm. So this is heart flow work that, that all of us need to be able to do in order to have a great relationship with ourselves first. And be, it's being honest about what's in your heart. That's what I'm getting, right? Being. Be honest. What's in there? You don't like it. You do like it a eh, little bit. Like we have to be able to be honest and hold ourselves accountable and know that it's okay to feel however it is that we feel. Mm-hmm. And until we can do that, every relationship that we have is going to suffer. That was that. That was another area that I heard when Luby was talking about are you proud of your silence? Mm -hmm. Because if you are not showing up fully in your relationships and then you're not being treated the way that you want to be treated, I had to admit I wasn't proud of my silence. And so many of us high performing women have been told, you know, we talk too much, you know, we want to take over. Big, never yeah, satisfied. Never satisfied <laughs> to the point that we have dumbed down our own voice. We dumbed it down and have taught that significant person in our lives that they can do what they want to do. Yep. And we might complain about it, but we won't hold them accountable to it. And that's a silence that I, I had to change. Mm-hmm. And my to make my relationships better because my silence was bringing me unavailable men. Mm. My silence was allowing me to settle for unavailable men and put my efforts instead of my efforts being to show up honestly. My efforts were she was trying to appease them so that they would show up for me. Isn't it? Isn't it ironic? Yeah, we want them to show up for us, but we don't. But show then we, up. but then we don't show up. Because we're afraid if we show up for them, they'll leave. Yep. And so I had to get to a point about 4950, that lack of integrity piece got called into question. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, God, from this moment on, I am going to date and relate authentically. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to send my goodwill ambassador. I'm not <laughs> going to send my laughing at jokes I don't find funny. Mm. I'm not going to send my pampering your ego. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean you have to be mean with your finger waving either. It just means you're present. Mm-hmm. It just it's a difference in being present and commenting on everything in a negative, condescending way. Because some people think showing up means I don't like that. Mm-mm. Or no, I got my own money. That's not showing up authentically. That's not showing up fully because the person I am when I show up fully is delightful. Exactly. The person I am when I show up fully is humorous, fun loving, genuine, Mm -hmm. forthcoming without being, without starting stuff, but just matter of factly, you know what? I used to like so-and-so, but let me tell you why I don't like it anymore. Exactly. And you know what? I I love that you say that because once I left corporate and it's still a process for me, I'm not pretending to be perfect by any stretch of the imagination. 
I've had to really learn what it looks, feels, walks, and talks like to show up authentically as myself because I got so used to wearing the work mask, to being in the office, right? And then simultaneously, I had a bunch of stuff that was going on in my marriage. So I silenced myself, which is where that stress came from, from other things as well. But even showing up to say, hey, you know what, sweetheart? I really don't like when you tickle my feet. It actually irritates me. I know I've been laughing all this time, but I I hate it. So I really would like you to stop, right? Much nicer than that, but it's little things. And honestly, I had a conversation today with a, a, a cousin of mine who normally I would say nothing, but we had a conversation and it hurt my feelings a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't okay with some of the behavior. And so being able to say, hey, I know we used to talk like that or you know, do X, Y, and Z, but I'm in a state where I no longer accept that kind of behavior. I love you, but you can't act like that around me anymore. Mm-hmm. And people are either going to accept that or they're going to dismiss themselves. And it goes back to, like you said, being accountable, accountable for what you like, what you don't like, what you're going to tolerate. And it's that this bad word, boundaries. <laughs> boundaries. Ba- and, and we have to we have to put them in place so that we can protect our peace. I was just going to say boundaries are for us, not for them. Thank you. For us, so we can have our peace because let me tell you, there's no price that you can put on peace of mind, no dollar amount. Because if up here, like we said, your wires are touching all the time. <laughs> I know that wires are touching. We don't, oh Lord, sparks be flying. <laughs> You're going to be burning everything, shocking everything you touch. No, get some peace. Get you some peace. <laughs> yes, please. No wire touching. No wire touching. <laughs> but it, it, when you were talking about authenticity, I think it's true. And I have to admit, as a high achieving person, when somebody said, just be, just be authentic, just be you, just be real. Honestly, I didn't know how to be authentic. And you would think that'd be the easiest thing in the world to be yourself. But if you've always performed, for other people, you don't even know. It's like you don't even know who you are, who you are, what you like. None of that. You have to get reacquainted. That's why that value work is so important. Yes, because you don't. I, I mean, I, I had, and that's why a lot of times I think when we coach people and we're asking them, "What do you want?" They can tell us what they don't want. Real fast. <laughs> Real fast. But that, what do you want? They got to go, hmm. Listen, that's still hard for me sometimes. I really, like you, I journal and I have to get out of my head so that it can flow from my heart. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that's the thing. A lot of us don't realize that our heart is connected. And I think. Maybe it's because we have been told or it's been modeled for us that our feelings don't matter. Mm -hmm. But one of the main ways it was it was very interesting how it kind of slipped up on me was one of the main things that God, the universe, my inner wisdom, whatever way you want to call it helped me to start getting back in touch with what made me authentic was asking me, how do you feel? Something so small, but so big, right? So big because I I ended up, because of course it was God asking, and I was so used to in my interaction with him, second guessing or censoring my feelings. First thing in the morning, I open my eyes and that voice would say, how do you feel? Mm. It took a whole week for me to feel comfortable enough to just tell God how I felt straight. No chaser. Mm. Imagine how many people still are waking up. It's take. I'm glad it took you a week. 
because so many of us are still walking around out of touch with how we feel, which is what leads to this buildup and this muck taking up our capacity because damn, that's, that's literally why I got into this because I was burying so much of how I felt with managing a a daughter who has chronic migraines and managing, you know, looking really good on paper and my career was blossoming, but feeling like a private failure and all of that stuff. When you do not address how you feel and you deal with it, Mm -hmm. it seeps out and so whether it's the resentment and your tone or it gives you a CPK level of 200,000 like it did me when the normal mm. level is 200, by the way, um, that shuts mm. your organs down. Like you got a oh. deal. So I'm so grateful that God got you right. And you were able to, that's the best place to practice, right? With God, there's no judgment. There's yeah. no, well, why you feel like that? <laughs> it's just, how yeah. do you? Feel? And I, cause I had to tune all that out because at some level, I think the happy feelings we're okay with. Mm-hmm. Those positive, happy, warm, fuzzy feelings, we're okay with those. But those darker feelings, those lower vibration feelings, those feelings where we feel vulnerable, out of control, Mm -hmm. feel like we're being a bad person, you know, those feelings we're not comfortable with. And and that, I think, goes to capacity as well, because nobody feels good all the time. And if you don't have the capacity to show grace to yourself and to believe that your creator, whoever, whatever you worship your faith, believe that will give you room to show up just as you are without judgment, without damning you, then that messes with your capacity too. Absolutely. Because you're carrying around, you know, what, you believe other people think you should be what you should do and you're not able to show up authentically. Like you said, you lose who you are in all of those different ways. And so we have to learn how to understand what it is that's taken up all of that capacity, Mm -hmm. learn what it is. And once you learn what it is, you take steps to, to, get better at it. And one of the things that I absolutely coach on is giving yourself grace because listen, nobody's going to be perfect all the time. Only body perfect was Jesus, right? To add to those lists of uh, recovering things, I'm a recovering perfectionist as well. Um, And Mm -hmm. being able to, I always say, extend yourself the same grace that you would give to somebody else whether it's your coworker, your friend, apply that to you. And part of my method towards the end of my coaching program, um, it's called plain, like make it plain. And the end is for nourishing and navigating. And the ability for you to be able to do that, you have to give yourself grace because it's not going to be perfect. It might not even look how you thought it was going to look. But giving yourself grace to make mistakes, to be, you know, new at something, to try things different, to release mindsets, relationships, all of those different things, they require grace. You can't do it without. You have to. You can't do it without. And for those of you that are listening that say, "Okay, I'm so glad you all know how to kind of be with yourself and journal and all that and and God speaking and all that. That's great for you. But for me, I need a little bit more help. Yes. Yes. (laughs) That's what Nicole is here for. She can usher you in the places that she has been. And that's the beauty is that you can usher them in places where you've been, but you no longer are. And so you can pull them into that new place that they need to be. So, so Nicole, as we bring this to a close, can you tell people how to get in contact with you and what you want their takeaway to be from our conversation? Absolutely. Um, Let me start with the takeaway. Okay. If there's nothing else that you get from our conversation, Know that your capacity and your ability to prioritize self-care is not a luxury. It's a necessity. It's an obligation. And in order to do that, you have to be aware. You got to start being aware of what's taking up your time, your capacity. You got to manage it in a way that allows you 
to show up authentically, to show up in excellence, and to be kind to yourself. So your capacity and managing it is not an option. And if you need some help with managing that capacity, <laughs> come on now, uh, come on now. You can uh, find me. My website is NicoleRone.com. That's N-I-C-O-L-E-R-H-O-N-E.com. I'm also on, <clears throat> excuse me, Facebook and Instagram. It's Nicole underscore Roan on Instagram and all my stuff is in my bio, the podcast, all of that. Um, and it's Nicole Roan on Facebook. And I do invite you to please, please, if you do nothing else, go take that capacity calculator because so many women message me on a daily basis that say, I had no idea this much was on my plate. I thought I was doing good, but clearly I'm still operating beyond max capacity. Oh man. It's a life changer. And I know my friend Nicole is a great person for you to work with. So don't suffer in silence. Time out for that strong woman suffering in silence thing, y'all. That's old. Put it in your back pocket. Matter of fact, your, don't even put it in your pocket. Just, throw it in the garbage. Throw it in the garbage. You do not have to suffer in silence. You do not have to have loose capacity. You don't have to just barely make it in life. You were created to thrive. And until next time, just remember that you're worthy. You are worth it. You are more than enough. Bye. You have just listened to the Enough Factor Podcast with your host, Suzette Fernand. To get notified of new episodes or to dig deeper into today's topic, become a subscriber. And while you're at it, tell us how we're doing and what topics you're interested in. We appreciate your feedback and your reviews. Until next time, remember, you are worthy, you are worth it, you are enough.